welcome to this episode of the Common Sense Skeptic, which was prompted by the FAA releasing this post on Twitter on September 17th, 2021. They're asking for public input into the ongoing operations of SpaceX in Boca Chica, Texas, at the mouth of the Rio Grande, and a short walk from the Mexican border. The FAA wants to hear from us, and boy are they going to. Common Sense Skeptic did an episode titled Musk vs. the FAA back in January of 2021, highlighting concerns we had with the way Musk was conducting operations in Boca Chica, including how he strong-armed Boca Chica residents out of their retirement beach community. That was pretty despicable, but the larger concern now is the destruction of surrounding pre-existing nature preserves and protected beaches that Musk has now built into his own personal rocket testing range. To recap some history, in order to lure Musk and SpaceX to South Texas, the state had to offer Musk certain incentives, as well as rewrite state law to accommodate space launches from that area. These changes to state law authorized Musk to launch variations of the proven, keyword proven, Falcon vehicle at the rate of one per month between the hours of 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. during weekdays only and not on weekends or on holidays. At the time, the FAA did an environmental assessment and it was based on this vehicle with this cadence and that supporting infrastructure. In other words, absolutely nothing like what Musk has been building at Boca Chica. What Musk is now calling Starbase does not resemble what he promised the state and federal regulators would be built there. It has turned into a manufacturing facility for an unproven vehicle, an unlicensed testing range, and an unending series of catastrophic explosions. The Starship vehicle under development on this site is many times larger than the Falcon vehicle the initial reports were based upon, and this vehicle shares absolutely no parameters with the Falcon system, meaning operations at Boca Chica are immeasurably more dangerous and overreaching than what any state or federal authority signed on for in 2014. And that's part of the reason why the FAA has halted flight operations at Boca Chica until these public input sessions and proper investigations can be conducted. In fact, this is part of an ongoing assessment that began back in December of 2020, specifically targeting SpaceX Starship operations in Boca Chica. Unfortunately, as part of this process, the FAA did not grind construction at the facility to a halt at the same time, and as a result, Musk has continued to build giant structures like the launch tower, for which he does not have FAA approval. The FAA does have the authority to tell Musk to bulldoze this, which they should, because that launch tower is built right next to the property line, and the blast zone of a launch from this site will extend well out into the protected areas surrounding it. This is the launch platform, and this is the property line. Even if this thing merely fell over, it would wind up laying about 480 feet inside the nature preserve and require heavy machinery to remove it from the site, machinery that does not belong in a nature preserve. With regards to this launch tower, Musk and SpaceX lied directly to the FAA in writing in May of 2021. SpaceX told the FAA in May that it did not believe this review was necessary because it only intends to use the integration tower for production, research, and development purposes and not for FAA licensed or permitted launches. But even at that time, the FAA said their description in documents indicated otherwise. And see that sign right there? What does it say? Starship Super Heavy Orbital Launch Pad. So Musk has been caught dead to rights lying in official paperwork to the FAA, and that's making them look like idiots if they don't shut him down. Boca Chica was built at the center of a trio of nature reserves with another one in close proximity. To the direct west of the launch complex is Boca Chica State Park. To the north is another state park called Brazos State Park. To the east are protected sand beaches used by five breeds of critically endangered sea turtles and to the south is the Las Palomas Wildlife Management Area that is home to endangered cats and ground nesting birds. This is the area that Musk lit on fire in July of 2019, scorching 100 acres thanks to a grass fire ignited by Starhopper. This is a fact largely ignored by the mainstream media. The brush it tore through is the natural habitat and denning area for those endangered cats that we mentioned, and any young kittens caught in this scrub during the fire would have never had a chance. Our video in January of 2021 was in response to Musk lipping off the FAA on Twitter because they were holding off on authorizing his SN9 launch. The reason why they were holding off on his SN9 launch is because they violated their license with their SN8 launch. SN8, of course, blew sky high when it came down hard at a 5 to 10 degree angle. That explosion resulted in an investigation. That investigation was not over by the time SN9 was ready to go. So SN9 was stripped of authorization, but Musk still ordered the machine to be fueled up as evidenced by the frost marks on the side of the craft. 
The YouTube channels that watched Boca Chica paint dry in real time were convinced that Musk was going to hop SN9 in defiance of that restriction, which obviously was a consideration given the fact that Musk fueled the craft after having the flight license revoked, but that event was eventually stood down. Not that it mattered in the end, once authorization for SN9 was eventually received on February 2nd, it performed even worse than SN8, coming down hard on its side and causing another massive explosion and debris field. SN10 hopped a month later on March 3rd and returned to Earth landing mostly upright, but landing hard enough on one side that the ship's skirt and tanks were crushed, and a fire under the skirt ignited the remaining fuel in the upper methane tank, launching the craft for a second time in a tremendous fireball over five minutes later. And then of course there was the SN11 hop of March 30th. Why Musk decided to launch this thing through a thick layer of fog is still a mystery that caught everyone by surprise. Those YouTube channels that have cameras trained on that launch pad just in case something happens. Even they caught none of the launch because of the fog. This vehicle exploded before it hit the ground, and when the fog lifted less than an hour later, spectators and channel cameras saw the debris field of this explosion was stretched over several square kilometers, with debris falling in yards as far as 8 kilometers away. All of these vehicles exploded at the end of their flight, therefore their propellant tanks were mostly empty. However, they still detonated like bombs and they threw razor-sharp stainless steel shrapnel in all directions. In comparison, a fully fueled Starship would be far more destructive, and a fully stacked Starship atop a super heavy booster would be next level devastation. In past episodes, we have compared the Starship and Super Heavy combination to a Soviet N1 rocket from the 60s. Some people get their noses out of joint with that comparison and the further comparison of that N1 detonation against the nuclear bomb that took out Hiroshima. And to those people who can't handle those numbers or that comparison, tough shit. The numbers are what they are. The Soviet M1 rocket carried a total of 680 tons of RP-1 and 1,780 tons of liquid oxygen. These propellants were contained in a series of spherical and hemispherical pressurized vessels that were completely separated from the sidewall of the rocket. After taking off from Bakanur Cosmodrome on July 3, 1969, N1, serial number 5L, lost its number 8 engine first which caused a cascading shutdown of other engines resulting in the vehicle plummeting back to Earth at a 45 degree angle. The vehicle carried 2300 tons combined of RP-1 propellant and locks, and the detonation upon impact triggered a massive shockwave that shattered windows across the complex. Debris was thrown 10 kilometers from the center of this explosion. Unburned droplets of fuel fell from the sky even half an hour after the explosion, and yet, as bad as this was, it could have been six times worse. Investigations show that the fuel and oxidizer didn't blend into a gel before detonating, nor did all the propellant get consumed at the same time. As it is with a 15% detonation, Launch Complex 110 East was completely leveled by this blast and it required 18 months to rebuild. Explosions of this magnitude are measured against kilotons of TNT. It is the same metric used to measure nuclear bombs. Estimates on N1L5 range from 1 to 7 kilotons, using only 15% of the propellants on board. The bomb that wiped Hiroshima off the map was a 12 to 15 kiloton blast. This is a similar detonation blast force comparison. The craft Musk is building is larger than the N1. Starship and Super Heavy in combination carry double the propellant load compared to the N1. There is no separation between isolated spherical fuel cells, because there is only a single dome between two giant reservoirs of fuel in each stage of the vehicle. The side of the craft is also the wall of those reservoirs, meaning you only have to breach one 4mm thick layer of stainless steel to release the contents of one reservoir. The change in pressure will likely cause the failure of that common dome, and that will allow everything to blend before ignition and detonation. And when this happens, the disaster at Baikonur will be dwarfed in comparison. By the way, Boca Chica has never been an ideal launch site for orbital vehicles anyway. Sure, it's the closest point of the continental U.S. to the equator, but when you look at the possible launch azimuths from this site, they are very restricted corridors, none of which result in a polar orbit trajectory. Considering these restrictions on possible launch trajectories, it begs the question, why was this site given any serious consideration in the first place? As we mentioned, on September 17, 2021, the FAA announced on Twitter they are looking for our input, your input, with regards to the draft programmatic environmental assessment for the proposed Starship Super Heavy project in Boca Chica, Texas. You have until October 18th to voice your concerns, as we all obviously intend to do. And while it's true there will likely be thousands of muskrats writing in to support this project, their voices and opinions will not matter. We'll repeat that. Their voices and opinions will not matter. Why? 
because this is an environmental assessment. There is absolutely no positive environmental aspect to the continued operations at Boca Chica. Nobody at the FAA cares if these people like rockets. This is not a popularity contest. This survey is to let the FAA know what your environmental concerns about this site are. This is your opportunity to remind the FAA that people are watching SpaceX grow larger and more bold in what they're doing because nobody has stopped them. Nobody is enforcing the rules or the laws. You need to remind them that the building that Musk has done in Boca Chica has all happened without FAA approval. And while you're at it, remind them what Elon Musk's record of environmental stewardship actually is. Remind them about the 100-acre wildfire. Remind them of the green turtle die-off in 2019. The explosions at all times of day and night. The cryogenic gases released during these explosions. And the 4,600 tons of carbon dioxide and water vapor greenhouse gas that come with every Starship launch. The environmental report the FAA conducted in 2013 and released in 2014 reported their concerns with a number of endangered and critically endangered species that inhabit this area and the protected lands surrounding the Boca Chica facility. Let's go through these one by one. Up first is the endangered ocelot. Ocelots are endangered because their habitat has been cleared for farming and to accommodate for the growth of cities. Between 30 and 35 of these beautiful cats remain in the Brownsville area. The U.S. population of this cat numbers less than 50. More than half of the American population of this cat live in this particular area. Next up, the southern coastal jaguarundi mentioned in this document was believed to be extinct in Texas, and they were reintroduced by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in 2014. The Rio Grande Valley is their native habitat, and these protected lands are part of that repopulation effort. You know, these brushlands that Musk doesn't mind burning down. There are also species of endangered birds in this area. The northern Aplomato falcon was listed as endangered in February of 1986, prompting a recovery and breeding program that has been successful, although their wild population continues to decline. This raptor is extremely sensitive to human disturbance, and loud or unusual noises will cause them to abandon their nest. Piping plovers are another threatened species that the FAA Environmental Assessment mentions. They are in recovery in the U.S., but have moved to the endangered list in other countries such as Canada. They are a shorebird that nests on the sandy ground. They are also extremely sensitive to disturbances and will abandon their nests if they're scared away. Red knots are another species of bird listed in that report as threatened, but they are declining in population towards being listed as endangered with an estimated population of less than 25,000 animals. And wrapping up the list, we've got five species of sea turtles that use the accompanying beaches, and every single one of them is endangered. The only question is, are they endangered or are they critically endangered? As it turns out, the rarest sea turtle on Earth is the Kemp Ridley sea turtle. And this particular turtle is mentioned in this environmental assessment as using the Boca Chica beaches as their nesting grounds. In any other situation, this would immediately qualify this entire area as untouchable. So too with the hawksbill sea turtle, which is also critically endangered. This turtle population has to combat not only human and predator consumption of animals and eggs, but also the tortoise shell jewelry market. These turtles face enough hurdles. They don't need to be dodging exploding rockets and stainless steel fragments raining down from the sky, especially since turtles are attracted to shiny objects. The leatherback sea turtles are next on the list, and guess what? They're critically endangered too. They are the very largest of all living turtles and the last remaining species of the genus Dermochilis in the family Dermochilidae, names indicating the animal's lack of carapace with only flexible leather-like skin across their back. Green sea turtles are the first on this list that are not critically endangered, yet. However, with their populations in decline, it is expected these turtles will also continue to face increased threats of commercial harvest for eggs and food, moving them from endangered to becoming critically endangered. And the loggerhead turtles wrapping up this list are firmly in the endangered category since their populations have fallen between 50 and 90 percent in the past six decades, that's according to U.S. fisheries. All these turtles need safe, secure, and protected beaches to lay their eggs, and those egg clutches cannot be walked or driven upon, otherwise the entire clutch can be lost. Now, we're going to preemptively answer the question that ignorant fanboys are going to ask. The question is, who cares about turtles? We do. You should. The health of the oceans depends on them. According to seaturtles.org, turtles are considered a keystone species, meaning they are an important part of the environment and they influence other species around them. Their homepage lists off five reasons that sea turtles are really, really important. 
For starters, they control their prey. Very few other animals eat jellyfish, and the favorite prey of jellyfish is fish larvae. So a healthy turtle population reducing the number of jellyfish increases the odds of survival for all manner of fish. And large populations of ocean sponges are capable of suffocating slow-growing coral reefs, so the turtles are protecting the reef and all its inhabitants through their diet. Also, turtles provide nutrients on the beaches they nest in, which provides sustenance for organisms further down the food chain, as well as coastal vegetation. Their hatchlings, sadly, provide an important food source for many other types of animals, with the vast majority of turtle babies never even making it to the water after hatching out. Coastal economies that at one time would have harvested these animals for food or leather or jewelry have now shifted their focus instead to ecotourism, with turtles at the center of that economy. And the seagrasses so many oceanic species rely on for food or habitat are kept groomed by grazing green sea turtles. Now there are people who will say losing these species is a small price to pay in the overall quest for space. And for those people, we have two words for them. Absolutely nothing on Earth should be destroyed in Musk's completely flawed quest to make humanity multiplanetary. Musk has proven through his reckless handling of environmental issues around the world that he does not care whatsoever about the environmental impact or stewardship of this planet. He's in a misguided sprint towards Mars, and it seems he doesn't care how much of Earth he needs to destroy in that quest. And if he plans on exporting that opinion off-world, he might as well be shut down right now. There is absolutely no reason why these species have to suffer at his hand, and these are just the land-dwelling animals. If Musk is allowed to move into the open ocean to launch off his refurbished oil platforms, there will be an entirely different environmental set of concerns above and below the water, as we went through in episode 8. But this survey being conducted for the FAA isn't dealing with that just yet. Right now the concern is the location in Boca Chica, and the protected species of that area need you to stand up for them. The FAA has been ignored by Musk at every turn. He is building launch towers without authorization, conducting launches without authorization. He is blocking state highways in contravention of state law. He is conducting test flights against his permit. He is not launching the vehicles the previous FAA environmental assessment was based upon, and he is acting with impunity as if he cannot be touched. Running in tandem with this increased activity on the site beyond the monthly launch schedule that was approved is the unending and overreaching closures of State Highway 4 by SpaceX far in excess of the 300 hours per year authorized by the state to accommodate Musk. SpaceX security guards routinely forbid people from accessing these public roads without authorization from the county. And any time the company is conducting tests or launches at these facilities, the remaining residents in Boca Chica are forced from their home by Musk with evacuation orders that don't even give the residents 24 hours notice, as proven by Boca Chica Gal's notices on Twitter. These closures and constant evacuation notices are unacceptable and are in fact breaking the law. Every single thing on this list is exactly why the FAA needs to shut down Starship operation at Boca Chica. At this point, and before this gets kicked down the road again, the FAA needs to demonstrate they are in charge, not Musk. Musk is a NASA subcontractor, nothing more, and if he can't play by the rules he signed on for, he needs to have those contracts revoked. Period. And he needs to return the money he's received from them as well. The residents that are being inconvenienced and blocked from their homes by SpaceX can speak up for themselves. They can approach their state and county officials and tell them enough is enough. But the wildlife in the area need your voice to speak up for them. As a side note, something else we hear far too often in defense of what Musk is doing in Boca Chica, surrounded by nature preserves, is this deflection. The muskrats say, well, Cape Canaveral is surrounded by nature preserves as well, so you're hypocrites for not wanting to shut down NASA too, right? Wrong. Why is it wrong? Because NASA bought the land surrounding the Kennedy Space Center, 140,000 acres in fact, specifically to create that natural buffer around the space launch complexes. This Nature Conservancy was added as a result of the Space Center, and it is maintained currently by the Department of the Interior. Because much of the installation is a restricted area and only 9% of the land is developed, the site also serves as an important wildlife sanctuary. Mosquito Lagoon, Indian River, Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge, and Canaveral National Seashore are the other features of this protected area. Center workers can encounter bald eagles, American alligators, wild boar, eastern diamondback rattlesnakes, the endangered Florida panther, and Florida manatees. Musk, on the other hand, built his unauthorized private testing range smack dab in the middle of two established state parks and two protected nature preserves, and he has given exactly zero thought towards the nature he flattens every day to expand his private enterprise, which has no chance of delivering on his promises of colonizing Mars. 
which makes all of this more distressing. This natural state, these endangered species being disrupted, the people forced from their homes in Boca Chica. At the end of the day, it will all be for nothing. Starship is doomed to fail. If you want to know why Starship is doomed to fail, start at episode 1 on this channel and start working your way forward. For the past year and a half, we've been proving it with careful dissection of every aspect of this half-wits vehicle. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of The Common Sense Skeptic, and please share this across all forms of social media. It is extremely important to not allow this opportunity to pass you by to have your say about the destruction caused by SpaceX in Boca Chica. The link on Twitter from the FAA account can be found by searching FAA We Want to Hear From You. It is dated September 17th, 2021. On the FAA website, click on Newsroom in the left-hand margin. It will bring you to this page. To get to the page regarding Boca Chica, click here. And on that page, this is the email address you will need to send your complaint to. It is SpaceXBocaChica at ICF.com, which, as you'll notice, is not an FAA email address. The company compiling these reports for the FAA is ICF.com, a consultancy firm under contract with several branches of the federal government. But even more important than sending your concerns in by email, do this as well, but also participate in the live hearings if at all possible. These are going to be held virtually on October 6th and 7th. Instructions on how to participate in this format will be published on the FAA webpage. We will share it on our channel community feed, and that will be no later than October 4th. This information needs to be shared far and wide because allowing Musk to continue along this path will cause irreversible harm to the Boca Chica area, and it will make it that much more difficult to stop him if he plans on opening additional facilities in the future. Before we go, this is our first fundraiser video. We are going to be donating a portion of the funds raised from this video to Wildlife Defenders, an organization with 2.2 million members who have recognized the dire situation of the critically endangered ocelot, jaguarundi, and sea turtles, and they continue to bring awareness to this situation. Visit Defenders.org and follow them on Twitter under the handle at Defenders. And thank you very much for doing your part to keep that entire area under better protection than it currently is.